uh, yes, thanks again for the kind words. So today, the second uh, part of my series of three talks. And, and so uh, tomorrow we will, I will conclude uh, with a kind of research talk about recent work on trigonometric game matrices, as the title suggests. But for this talk, which is more like a, a lecture, like a blackboard lecture almost, if you like, as much as I can uh, manage from a distance, it's, it's more about some uh, algebra and especially representation theory that I will need tomorrow. Um, and so we're going to depart the world of integrable systems temporarily, although we'll keep it in the back of our minds. And so uh, again, as before, any questions, please interrupt. So I welcome questions for anybody, but especially from uh, PhD students and postdocs, because uh, uh, basically I'm trying to give these lectures to uh, kind of introduce new people to, to this field, which is kind of a developing part of integral systems. And so please ask whenever you can also afterwards by email is fine. So uh, before I actually get started, I hope you don't mind if I give do some uh, brazen advertising on behalf of my employer. Uh, if there's any uh, people interested in a postdoc position here in, in Beijing, while well, we're a growing institute, so please consider looking at the website for more information. You can also email me for kind of informal questions. So that ends the kind of uh, commercial break. So today I want to have kind of two topics. I want to introduce the notion of a completion of an algebra. And then afterwards, I want to talk about the, the Drinveld Jimbo quantum group and a particular class of modules that were as a, that's important for the construction of R matrices and also K matrices, as we'll see tomorrow. Okay. And so I want to kind of go slowly through it because it's kind of uh, it's fairly uh, pure mathematical, so I'll, kind of technical in some way. But I will illustrate part one with a kind of a running example of a fairly straightforward algebraic uh, object, the straightforward algebra, the oscillator algebra, which is I think fairly well known. Uh, and then uh, hopefully it will illustrate the concept of completion quite well. And then uh, quantum groups are a bit more complicated, so I don't have to give all the detail in part two and. I hope it, it will make sense because of the example of we've seen in part in, in, in uh, section one of the talk today. Okay. So an observation you can make uh, about, let's say, solutions of the Young-Baxter equation in a universal setting. So somehow solutions in, an, in the algebra of, uh, of symmetries of a collection of mod models uh, is that a purely algebraic setting is not enough to describe these solutions. So it's too restricted. In a finite, for finite dimensional algebras, you can actually construct uh, solutions of the Young-Baxter equation, let's say, in the algebra itself. But those uh, finite dimensional algebras typically don't have interesting representations for us. And so the quantum groups that we'll look at uh, later, they are the first type where you have a, uh, they're more kind of more complicated in some sense. You need, you need to actually go outside the algebra uh, to uh, describe these solutions. And so uh, you have to, in some sense, complete the algebra. And so that's, that's a kind of topological flavor to that idea. And um, I'll give you a kind of a general approach, one possible general approach uh, to how to formulate this idea of completion. I think that's a useful thing to, to have seen once. Uh, and uh, well, there, there's different, uh, different approaches to this notion of completion, but this is fairly, fairly general. You don't need to know any topology, for instance, topology. Can be seen to arise from what I will say uh, in, the, in the next like half hour or so, if if you wish, if you like to view things in a topological way. But I won't emphasize this. Okay. So the idea is to uh, look at completions of uh, unital associative algebras, what is called an algebras, to a class of representations. And in the very end, uh, we will be interested in the class of finite dimensional representations of the quantum loop algebra. Tomorrow we'll, we'll be interested uh, in that. And, but here I will kind of work with some more basic examples first, because that is a rather tricky class of representations. Okay. And so this is known uh, also as a Tanakian formalism for completions, uh, which is a more general category, category theoretical formalism. Uh, and you can find uh, Okay, a good uh, explanation for this from like more background if you want. And uh, notes by Deligne from 90, 1990. And also uh, it's very similar to Brinfeld's approach uh, in starting in 86 to this. 
which is probably more close to the application to integrability. Okay, um, so although it's a category theoretical uh, setup, I won't actually use those words. I will try to make it kind of as, as plain as possible, but at the end, you can say that you're category theorists anyway, uh, at least kind of budding category theorists. Okay, so I'll start with what we need. We need an associative algebra, and we need a class C, which I also this notation I also used in the first lecture on Monday, a particular class of representations. Uh, and what you want to think is that you don't just have the class of the modules, you also have all the intertwiners between these modules. And so that that, that actually constitutes a category already. Uh, so I will just remind you of the definition of intertwiner here, because that will uh, be used throughout uh, this, this part. So if you have two uh, A modules, an intertwiner, in particular, an intertwiner of the algebra A, to be precise. What is it? It's a linear map from M to N. Let's give it a name, actually. Let's call it uh, F, with a property that a particular diagram commutes. Let me first draw a diagram and then write it down kind of in, uh, in plain language. So you can go from M to M with the action of little a, where little a is just some element, an arbitrary element of my algebra. And I can also go from n to n with the action of a, the same, the same element. But I can also go from m to n with f, right? And it shouldn't matter which way I go around this diagram. So this is a commuting diagram. And it just means the following, if you want to, if you prefer it into a, in terms of a direct equation. So for all, uh, little m in my module, for all vectors in my module, if you like, I can first apply a uh, to little m and then apply the, this linear map f. Or I can first apply the linear map f and then apply the action of a. Okay, so this action is in uh, capital M, the module capital M, and this is in capital N. Okay, so I use the same notation dot. Uh, here, which is a bit sloppy, but hopefully it's clear. Um, and so you could say that intertwiners are simply linear maps which compute with the action of the algebra. Okay. And so let me, I can just, I can restate this statement with, uh, it's a completely equivalent formulation, but with a different emphasis, which will be useful later on. I can say that elements of my algebra uh, have the property that their actions commute with all intertwiners. You agree it's the same statement. I can say all intertwiners commute with the action of all elements, but I can also say all elements, the action of them commutes with the, with all intertwiners. It's the same statement. I just emphasize the elements here. And that will be useful in the next uh, the definition, which is the definition of a completion. Okay. And so uh, roughly speaking, a completion of an algebra A with respect to a cat this category C, or sorry, I should say maybe it's the class of, particular class of modules, which I call C, this class, is just a set of all formal expressions or series, if you like, of elements of A that have a well-defined action on all modules in my category, of all modules in this class C. Okay, somehow that I need to write down properly. So let me first do an example, and then based on that, we can see some aspects of this, and then the definition will be less kind of scary, it will be more natural. So this will be a running example, I will come back to it later. So this is the while or oscillator algebra. So I'll call it A in this case as well. Um, so it uh, has two generators, little a and little b, and they satisfy the relation a b minus b a is one, okay? So just looking at that, uh, you can, uh, fairly straightforwardly write uh, a basis as a vector space. So this is an infinite dimensional algebra and the basis is given by these powers of B times these powers of K of A. It's fairly straightforward, follows from this relation. So that's uh, as vector spaces. Okay, so we know precisely what the elements, the general element of A looks like. It's a linear combination of these guys. Now I will look at the class of modules that I'm interested in. That is a convenience for purpose purposes of, of this talk. So I will call it graded modules. 
So I'll call this C with GR as subscript to be precise. So these are A modules M with a, a decomposition uh, as follows in terms of uh, some subspaces M sub N. And I'm, I'm prescribing uh, how little A and little B act on these subspaces. So I want that A of M, N plus N lowers the this uh, degree, if you like, this grading. A of M zero should just go to zero. And B should increase the grading. Okay, and so this is for all uh, non-negative integers in. Okay, and so uh, you can construct, for instance, uh, straightforwardly uh, an infinite dimensional module with, where all these MNs are one dimensional. It's not hard to explicitly write down uh, kind of an abstract way or, you know, just write down some a basis for this module and just say A acts like this, it increases and B decreases with some explicit coefficients in front of it. And that's kind of a, perhaps a, a standard, you could say it's the standard module for this algebra. Anyway, but I'm looking at the class of representations. There's many more like that. There might be finite dimensional, there might be infinite dimensional. I'm making an op before I uh, make a look at a particular element, which I say will be in the completion, like a particular series, if you like, I'm making one observation. Um, and, the note, and so for any module in this class, uh, for any, uh, have the following property. I can take any uh, vector in my module, and I can say that there is some integer k, a non-negative integer k, k, such that a particular power of a sends m to zero. Okay, and uh, this is kind of like a nil potency statement, except that the power of k, so the power k, could depend on little m. There might be a little a different power for uh, different uh, little m. And so, especially if the module is infinite dimensional, there might not be an upper bound to this k. It, I mean, so I could say that for every uh, for every vector, every vector is annihilated by a suitably high power of a, but there's no upper bound potentially. So this is locally nilpotent. This is called. Uh, this is to say that um, a acts locally nilpotently on m. And this is true for any any such module and follows from this condition uh, on the action of, of A on, on such modules. Okay, so I'm kind of having kind of universal approach here where I'm looking at several modules at the same time. And so, and so uh, you could say uh, if this little k uh, would not depend on little m, it would just be a nilpotent action. But here it's a bit more subtle, it's a local nilpotent action. Okay. So you can think of these A's, if you like, as uh, these A's and B's both actually as ladder operators. So, you know, B goes up and A goes down the ladder. It's just a fairly standard uh, picture. Okay, now I'm making a claim. An element, this element X, which I denote now, define now, it's a, basically a series, linear combination of all powers of A for any, for your favorite complex numbers, it doesn't really matter what they are, uh, has some nice properties. So this is a series, right? This is not really in the algebra if you choose the C, if, if the C's are, if there's infinitely many non-zero values, values among the CN, then it's not in the algebra really. Anyway, I can claim that one X has a natural action on uh, any M in my uh, class C, and this action commutes with all intertwiners. Uh, rather, I should say these actions, because I can act with X on any module in my category. So these actions. Okay, and that, that sounds very similar to what I just said about elements of A. But so also this, this series also has this property I claim. We have to show it. It's not hard to show. Okay, so for part one, uh, so, so let's just choose uh, an arbitrary module. In an arbitrary element of my module, but I'm making no assumptions, so this is completely general. And I'm just denoting a defining a, an integer here, n of m, which will be the maximum of all the uh, non uh, let's say non-negative integers, such that 
a to the power n acting on m is not zero. Okay, because of the local nilpotency condition, this is a well-defined uh, integer, a non-negative integer itself, and it's not a point. It's not infinite. It's an actual number. Okay, because of local nilpotency, and now I can define an, uh, a linear map x sub capital M by specifying an action on this arbitrary element of capital M as follows. I simply sum up to and including this nm term. And I stop there. So this is a well-defined element of capital M. Right? It's a linear combination of finitely many uh, elements of, of capital M. So it's another element of capital M. OK. So really, this is the definition. When I said I'm defining this element x here as this series, that is completely meaningless in some sense. This is the actual important definition. I'm defining an, an operator on my module, and I can do this for any module in this class C. So I may suggestively write this as x dot m, right? Because the higher powers of a send m to zero by definition of n n m by this definition I made here. Okay, so I could write it like this. Okay, and I can say, well, look, there's my element x. This is a series. And so I can say this is, uh, I can kind of suggest now this, uh, or let's say I can motivate this notation of the series. Okay, so it makes sense to, to write these, these, these things like that. Okay, uh, but it really is that uh, the point is that uh, the definition lies in all specifying all these linear maps, X sub capital M for every module M in my class. Okay. And so you kind of think, well, let's say you, 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 you're kind of tempted to view uh, x sub m as the action of x on m. But that's kind of the wrong way around. Really, m is, it is x. It's just a collection of all these linear maps. That's really how I define x. So the linear maps, they are uh, kind of the, the, what guides what guide us here. Okay, and the second claim I made was that uh, this commutes with intertwiners. Okay, so let me take an arbitrary inter intertwiner. Okay, then certainly I can write uh, that f of a to the power n applied to m is a to the power n applied to f of m for all positive, non-zero, uh, non-negative integers n for all m in my module. That's the definition of intertwine. And so I can uh, now take this infinite series, which is actually not an infinite series because both sides uh, terminate, both, both summation truncate by definition of my class C. And now I can say, well, look, this is my element x. Uh, so this is f of x dot m. And this is x dot f of m. Okay, and so ra rather to be more precise, this is really the m action of x, and this is the n action of x. And that's what I needed to show. I just claimed that these uh, these linear maps are are really what guide us, and these these collections of linear maps they uh, commute with intertwiners like this. Okay, and so I, I I've, I've proven my claim here. So that's the end of the example for now. And so. This kind of sets the stage for the definition. So if there's any questions, please, please feel free to interrupt. But I'm just going to make the, the give the definition in general for, for completion, which will be very similar to what we've just seen. So is there a question? I can't quite hear it. Uh, there is a question of the Hello. Okay, <laughs> uh, just on the point two, well, why you don't show the D, the F commutative D, you don't need to show that? No, no, by definition, F commutes with B because F is an intertwiner. So I don't actually need that for this argument. I'm not, I'm not claiming that I'm constructing an intertwiner and I have to show it's an intertwiner. I, I have to, I have to con I'm constructing an element or rather a co collection of linear maps okay. that commutes with all intertwiners. So the, the, that's why I'm changing the emphasis from, from the definition of intertwiner. So algebra elements 
the action of algebra elements can be called intertwiners. And I'm now looking at an element which is not really an algebra element, but all these linear maps still commute with all intertwiners. And they kind of generalize, in some sense, uh, the action of elements of the algebra. So I don't have to show that F commutes with B. It's, it's, it's given, but I don't need it. Is it clear? Yes. OK, thanks. Good, good question. So again, we're now in a more general situation. So not necessarily this oscillator algebra, but just A is an algebra, and C is a, a class of A modules. The completion of A with respect to C denoted by, so it sometimes is denoted with a hat, but then you don't really know what C you're talking about. Also, hat also means affine sometimes. When you talk about quantum so that'd be confusing so i'll just denote it like this to make sure that we know what what category we're talking about so what is it it's the set of all uh, collections uh phi or tuples if you like of linear maps where for all i need to specify this for all modules in my class c okay with the following properties so one, for all these modules, phi m is a linear map from m to m. If they mimic elements, the action of elements of the algebra in the sense that diagrams, certain diagrams commit. So for any two modules in my class, and for all intertwiners, f from m to n, and it's the same diagram we've already seen, except now it's about this phi m and phi n rather than action of an element. Okay, so components of phi commute with all A intertwiners like that. So this diagram commutes. Okay, so that's the, it generalizes what we've just seen about this oscillator algebra. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's all there is to this definition. So it's just a set of some kind of collections of linear maps. We have to say something more about it. There's some nice structure on this, but first let's go back to the example. So this is continued from the previous uh, example. So I have this, again, this, this class of graded modules. So we now know that X is in A completed with respect to this class of graded modules. That's what we proved in the first part of the example. Now I'm going to give you another element of this completion. So fix a complex number, let's call it Q, just to be, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say controversial or let's say uh, challenging or we'll make a connection with, with quantum mechanics slightly. Define for uh, any such module that we're interested in, an operator, Q to the power D, is just a notation, it doesn't mean anything yet, but I'll also label it with M because I want to say it's about this module M at the moment. Uh, by uh, requiring uh, on this subspace M sub N on any such subspace as multiplication by Q to the power little m. So this Q to the D or rather this D if you could say measures the degree of um, uh, the degree of uh, an element, let's say, of, of my module. Okay, and so uh, I, but I'm actually interested in a map that measures Q to the degree, and so I call it Q to the power capital D. But it's just a name. I could have called it something else. Okay. Here's an exercise for, uh, um, well, for anybody who's interested. I, I think I'm allowed to send exercises as a lecturer. If I now put all these uh, linear maps together in a tuple, in a collection, Let's call it Q to the D. Show that it actually is also in the completion. So you have to give a similar argument as we did for X, but maybe it's actually slightly easier here. Also, which is a good thing to show, uh, that Q to the D sub M is not equal to the action of an, any element of A on M for some M, for at least one M. Okay, so that means Q to the D 
does not lie in the algebra. If it lay in the algebra, it would be the action of some element of the algebra. So we really have new elements. So the completion here is somehow bigger than the original algebra. Okay, that conclude, concludes that uh, example. We'll come back to it one more time later. Okay, I'm going to give you some general properties of completions without much additional assumptions, just kind of general properties for any algebra A, for any class of module C. This set AC is actually an algebra in a natural way because the component wise, you have just linear maps and linear maps can be summed together, they can be scalar multiplied and they can be multiplied together by composition because they're all linear maps from M to M, from one set to itself. So you have uh, component wise, uh, let's say linear combinations. So it's a vector space and multiplication, which is the composition of linear maps. So you have an algebra structure, an associative algebra structure, right? So I can, for instance, say I can take such a, a collection, I can take another collection, and I can say the product is simply the composition of these linear maps, but they're all put together in a new, in a new tuple. Okay, the action of any elements from my algebra itself, all modules in C, defines an element of the completion. Okay, this is because what I said at the start, uh, from the flows from the definition of intertwiner, that all element, the action of all elements of the algebra commute with all intertwiners, and are linear, they're certainly linear maps, so they satisfy the definition of completion with respect to that class of, class of modules. Okay, and so what you get from this is an algebra homomorphism from A to this completion. Okay, because the composition of elements of the algebra, the multiplication of elements of the algebra corresponds to composition of the corresponding actions on, in modules, just by the definition of module. Okay, now it becomes really uh, kind of interesting. If so, this is an assumption you have to make, it's not automatically true. If this category C separates points, so what does that mean? In other words, if for all elements in the algebra, distinct elements of the algebra, the action of A and the action of B are distinct for, for at least one module in my category, right? So you can separate the, the elements by studying their actions. Then this map that I just defined is injective. So it's an embedding, an algebra embedding. And so that's why we call it a completion. It's really a, an algebra that contains the original. Algebra. And so we will view, in this case, we will view A as a subalgebra. Um, one more general observation. If I compare my class of modules with a different class of modules, say a bigger class of modules, then the completions also have an inclusion, but it goes the other way around. The more modules you add to your class of interesting modules, the more restricted the possible tuples of linear maps are because they have to commute with all these intertwiners. And so the completion becomes smaller. Okay, right, I'll go back to this example now. Um, so a continuation of the previous example. Again, an exercise to show that this class of graded modules that I defined separates points. And uh, the hint, I guess, Sometimes it's uh, easy to do this. For the quantum groups, it's not uh, quite as straightforward as this, uh, this uh, approach you can do here. You just have to construct one injective representation, one faithful module. Find one faithful module. Then you can separate the action of elements by just looking at that one module. So certainly you can separate the action of elements by this, this class. Okay? That's the hint. So perhaps you know which faithful module you should take. That's, that's the end of that example. So for, for this oscillator algebra, we have actually found uh, a particular uh, extension, a really an algebra, a bigger algebra that contains the original algebra. Okay, I'm having a quick look at the time. I should uh, wrap up this first uh, in general section. So uh, I can also define um, completions of, the, of tensor product of two algebras. So the tensor product of two algebras is another algebra. So you can talk about uh, the class of representations. 
And so for here, it is good to assume straight away that A is a bi-algebra. The, the class of modules uh, is compatible with tensor products. And so you can actually do this for any, any, finite, product, any finite tensor product. And again, it goes in, in the same way. You look at uh, particular commuting diagrams. So the elements of this, uh, let's say, just look at this kind of completion of this tensorial square. So the, the elements of this are basically uh, families of uh, uh, linear maps. Let's call them uh, phi again, but now indexed with two modules. And they have to commute with tensor products of intertwinings and so on. So commuting with, you know, with a similar constraint, so an analogous definition. And then you have an embedding of AC, the completion, tensor the completion to this completed tensor product. And this is not necessarily, uh, oh, it's catching up, it's there. It's not necessarily uh, an, uh, uh, a surjective map. So this is it is possible that this tensor product, so the completed tensor product contains more elements than the tensor product of the completions. And for instance, for instance, the universal R matrix, which lives in such a completion, is not does not lie here. You can't you can't just write the universal R matrix as tensor product of two limits, even if you use completions. It's really an um, now there's another thing that we can say when A is a bi-algebra. Uh, let's say, um, well, there's a co-product, right? When you have a bi-algebra, you have a co-product, which is a map from A to A tensor A, and also there's a co-product that you can define on this completion. So the completion becomes a bi-algebra in some sense. So uh, notice this, this class of representations is uh, closed under tensor products because it's a bi-algebra. And so assume that my uh, class that I chose from the, all these representations is also closed, which is an assumption I made on Monday straight away. We're interested in combining like single particle states to multi-particle states, right? So we want to have we want to tensor things together. We want to be able to tensor things together. Okay. And now the structure of the bi-algebra structure of AC. So a the completion AC is a bi-algebra. And I'll just give you the formula for the tall products. Well, bi-algebra in a kind of in a, in a weak sense, so I'll, I'll show you what I mean, but there is a natural notion of co-product that goes from AC to this uh, com completion of the tensor product. So it doesn't go to the, the tensor product of the completions, that would, then it would be an actual genuine bi-algebra, but that's not the case. You have this sort of map, and what, how does it work? You can take any uh, elements from, uh, from your completion, and then you send it to the collection of all the maps on tensor products. And this is precisely what, how it works for algebra elements. That's precisely what the co-product tells you. The co-product of an element tells you how it acts on a tensor product. And so the natural extension of this for the completion is this formula. Okay, so you have this co-product map and it kind of gives a bi-algebra structure. So we all have, we kind of have all that machinery at our disposal for quantum groups as well. So I always want to end with some, some comments on uh, Dreamfeld Jimbo quantum groups. Uh, I might not kind of finish uh, what I want to say, but I can continue with it tomorrow, basically, as part of my uh, research talk, which is about uh, Dreamfeld Jimbo quantum groups of a particular type. But let me make a start. Any questions up to this point about this kind of general story about completions? I just want to remind you not so much of the precise definition of the Dreamfeld Jimbo quantum group, which is kind of lots of generators and relations, uh, but more like the general uh, philosophy, the general structure uh, that follows from this, from this uh, definition. You can, you can, of course, look the definition up somewhere and there's slightly, slight variations, but it doesn't really matter which definition you choose. But um, I'm talking about the uh, chevalet Serre type presentation of the Jimbo quantum groups. So you have a, a Katsumuri algebra G. And again, I'm not going to give you the definition of that. I'm just it reminds you of two classes of examples, semi-simple finite dimensional Lie algebras uh, and affine Lie algebras, the more properly particular um, extensions of loop algebras of simple finite dimensional Lie algebras. And so they have a chevalet Serre type uh, presentation. So it looks like this, you have some finite number of generators E and F, where I is some finite index set, which is usually interpreted as the nodes of a Dinkin diagram. So even if the algebra is infinite dimensional, there's a finite 
number of generators. And then there's some commutative uh, algebra called Carton algebra. Okay. And so there's certain relations which I don't specify. Um, and so how the idea is that this, this is basically a bunch of SL2s talking to each other, or rather, there are, this is generated by a bunch of SL2s talking to each other, and the relations between these SL2s are contained in some combinatorial datum, either a Cartan matrix, but for these uh, these two types, you can actually just use the, the Dinkin diagram itself completely to indicate this particular combinatorics. Okay, and so you can, for instance, have SLN and so on as, as a particular example. Okay, and so we can, and so this has a, for all these uh, katsumori lie algebras, there's a, a triangular decomposition as vector spaces. And so n plus is the sub algebra generated by all the e's so i's and, and minus algebra generated by all the fi's. And maybe I should say here that if you look at, for instance, SLN, uh, so ei would be something like this with a one somewhere above the diagonal, and fi would be the transpose of that with a one somewhere below the diagonal. It would be the SLN example. And of course, you can make n minus one choices if you work with an n by n matrix of the position of that one. So there's uh, it gives you an idea of how, the, how, how big the Dink diagram should be. And anyway, that's uh, how you can encode it precisely. Okay, and so I can look at the universal enveloping algebra. And then because of this decomposition, I have this isomorphism of uh, vector spaces again, but now with tensor products. And this can be quantized. That was the, the point of quantum groups. So there's a UQG, which is again uh, a list of generators and relations and so really but it, this is really uh, not the definition but more like a, a, pro a key property the triangular decomposition but the definition is similar it's now an algebra associated algebra generated by the same type of generators with capital letters this time and some uh, group algebra of a lattice which is this uqh so in the lattice there's some choice in there but it doesn't really matter that's uqh okay and so this is a so universal enveloping algebras are uh, co-commutative FOP algebras, and UQG isn't quite that, but it's close. It's a quasi-triangular FOP algebra, but really that's a lie. It's up to completion, and that's why I wanted to talk about completions. So that means that uh, this statement really means that there exists an R in some completion of the tensor product. With a particular category O, which I'll define in a second, but it's just like a particular class of representations, just as it was before, and satisfying the usual relations for quasi triangularity. So it intertwines the co product with the opposite and then some co product relations, co product formulas, I should say, for R, which I don't specify yet. It's too much detail. And then from this, you can deduce, which is kind of the point for, from our point of view, the main reason, the Young Baxter. And all these relations I write down here are not really relations in the algebra, but in an appropriate completion of a, the tensorial square or a tensorial cube. And so this category O, oh, let me finish on that. It's very precisely defined. As, uh, originally, uh, Bernstein, Gelfand, Gelfand, from the, I think the 60s or the 70s, they, from the 70s they considered this. But I'm looking at a slightly different version, like due to cuts, I think, originally which has the great benefit that it becomes that it's closed on the tensor products. The original definition is not closed on the tensor products. And so this category, let me just say this class of representations, but it really is a category as well. It's the class of all quantum group representations. So UQG modules, let's call them uh, V, such that, so there's a list of requirements. So first of all, we have some kind of uh, direct sum decomposition, just as we had for this graded class for the oscillator algebra. So you have some kind of uh, decomposition in subspaces. They are labeled by some uh, weights. Uh, so this is some kind of lattice, some abelian group, the weight lattice. Doesn't really matter. Uh, well, it is a precise definition, but it points at some kind of uh, discrete group. And so V lambda, so this is really a uh, kind of a, Again, uh, elements of this of this of these vector spaces are finite sums of, of weight vectors of elements from these v lambdas, and so v lambda you can think of it as the joint set of all the joint eigenvectors of UQH with eigenvalues. This is kind of from a general Lie theory perspective. You get this definition, 
okay? The dimension of each of these is finite. This is uh, Katz's condition. There was originally a different condition here uh, in bernstein gelfand gelfand work, but Katz wrote, use this condition instead. And U cube N plus, this is perhaps the most important condition. This is, it, so far it was kind of standard, you know, decomposition, so you can actually do, say things and do things, but now we have a, kind of a strong condition. This U cube N plus could be clear that's this algebra generated by the EIs acts locally finitely. And so what does that mean? For all V, you know, for all vectors, I can just look at the module uh, generated by, by that vector, which is a subspace of my vector space, is finite dimensional, okay? And so if I just, if you look at quantum SL2, when you just have one E, right? You have E, F, and some kind of Q to the H, let's say. But if, anyway, so then it, then it just means that this E has to act locally and potently. But if you have more than one E, then it's not quite the same as that all the E's act locally and potently. Somehow the collection, the, gen, the algebra generated by the all E's has to have this property. That's the right uh, substitute, let's say, for this uh, locally finite condition for one generator. And finally, which is really kind of uh, tedious, I have to say, it has to be a type one representation, which basically means just that it, uh, it clearly forms a representation of the Lie algebra. And it's just a kind of a, uh, not so important in some sense, but everybody assumes this condition. And sometimes it's forgotten to state it, but that may be complete. But there's a precise formulation for this. But that's the upshot is it. It means it's related to a Lie algebra. It comes from a Lie algebra representation. Okay. Um, well, the key facts is that O is a braided tensor category, and so that basically means uh, that the straight con straight con straightforward consequence from this quasi triangularity up to completion. So it's not that the, all the modules of the of my quantum group have this property that I uh, have young baxter equations in all of them, but only let's say it's only claimed for this category O. G is finite dimensional, like SLN, or you're talking about UQSLN. Then uh, O contains uh, finite dimensional modules, UQG modules. Uh, so type one, again, clear, right? So that's, that's like, okay, that's good. At least we want, to be in, we want to study finite dimensional modules, right? So we should make sure that our category contains them. But the way the category was defined made it suggestive. That it would be uh, that they would be contained in it. However, if the if the dimension of G is infinite, for instance, in the affine case, when you look talking about extensions of loop, al loop algebra, then O contains no non-trivial finite dimensional UQG modules. Uh, and so that's kind of bad news for us because we want to work with finite dimensional uh, loop uh, representations of the quantum loop algebra. Uh, and so this 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 uh, category O uh, doesn't really directly uh, see them in any uh, any way directly. Uh, and so this R matrix, this universal R matrix that you can construct in, in some way in completion, doesn't have automatically at least a well-defined action on such, uh, on tensor products of such modules, which we're interested in integrability. So even with this kind of careful formulation of completion, there's still some kind of bridge to cross. So you can actually consider a different category, the one you're actually interested in, category of finite dimensional representations of the quantum loop algebra. And then, um, so let me just end it on this note and I'll kind of give more detail tomorrow as part of my lecture anyway. Uh, Drinfeld in uh, 87, following work by Jimbo in 86, uh, showed that it actually is possible if you're fairly careful uh, to uh, think of this R matrix as somehow having an action on tensor products of finite dimensional quantum loop algebra modules. And so you can use it to generate solutions of the spectral, the parameter dependent young Baxter equation. Uh, so Jimbo before him, a year before him, did this by explicitly solving intertwining equations in such modules, at least in particular examples of this. And they actually constructed lots of explicit R matrices for these, uh, for these modules, with they called also uh, Jimbo Bajanov, Bajanov uh, R matrices. So they're contained the well-known six vertex R matrix as a special case. Uh, but so Drinfeld showed actually uh, you don't you can do this, this is fine. Uh, but uh, there is actually the origin of these trigonometric R matrices that Jimbo constructed is still this universal R matrix, but you have to first turn it into a series, a formal Laurent series, or in fact a formal power series with respect to the spectral parameter Z. And here you have to treat the spectral parameter Z as a formal parameter initially. You can't just think of it as a complex number straight away. 
Okay, and so I'll be I'll give some more detail uh, tomorrow, but that's kind of the philosophy. So even with this completion stuff, which is necessary, it's not sufficient, and you need to be careful with with how to interpret this universal R matrix on on modules on finite dimensional quantum loop algebra modules, and it's the same for universal K matrix. Okay, so I think I should stop here. So then there's some time for any questions that might might still be. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions, comments? So for the uh, infinite dimensional algebras, so which of the four conditions, defining conditions, is violated? Finite? Ah, uh, well, actually, um, these finite dimensional modules, they aren't actually, so the finite dimensional modules we're interested in aren't actually modules of uh, UQG of the affine quantum group at all. If you define the affine quantum group with the proper full carton, which includes, which includes like these, uh, Degrading elements, let's say, or q to the power of degrading elements. They're not actually modules of that. And so uh, they're only modules of this sub algebra uh, where you discard this, uh, discard this grading element. You just have the e's, the f's, and the q to the h's, let's say. But then you don't have this category O notion. You can't use the general category O Katsburi machinery uh, for, for, uh, for that sub algebra. And so uh, there's not directly uh, a way out, way out of that, except, uh, let's say, by what, what Drinfeld is, is, by carefully looking at the formula for this, or like properties of this universal R matrix and see how, it's, how it can be used to still uh, um, act on, on finite dimension. Well, but you have to be careful there and you have to introduce this spectral parameter in the algebra already as a formal parameter. And for uh, so Q is generic for you, or you don't have to have the or? Ah. So I, I didn't quite uh, hear the question, but I think you mentioned roots of unity. And I, that's actually a good point. I forgot to say this. So the Q, I, I, I should have said this uh, here, I guess. So Q is a non-zero complex number and not a root of unity. That's a very good point, actually. Otherwise, the representation theory will be quite different. So I'll add it to my notes. Thank you. But the, the type one is not the piece. You forget the not good. Uh, representation of two of yeah, yeah. So, uh, so if you did, I'm just, I'll illustrate it with uh, quantum SL2. So, yes, the short answer is yes. But if you just look at quantum F SL2, so you have E, F, and let's say Q to the H and Q to the minus H to be precise. And so you have the, um, uh, with some relations, the, you know, the standard relations. And so Q to the H, you wanted to act uh, the action of H raised, you know, Q, Q to the power. That action. So you you can also let it act by uh, with a minus sign of quantum with q to the power h. So you can basically, if you look at the relations for quantum SL2, you can let's say uh, have an automorphism that sends e to minus e, f to f, it keeps f, but it sends q to the h to minus q to the h. And so you can factor out this automorphism from the representation and then you get type one representation. So the, 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 the other ones are kind of annoying, but yeah, you can always go back to a type one representation. So we just discard them straight away. They're not interesting to us or to any, to most um, pure mathematicians either. Then, yeah, there's a straightforward way to get rid of. Other questions? Online, no questions. So let's thank the speaker again. And uh, we have.